I'm trying to record this time, fourth time, whatever is because maybe there's charm for that. How was everyone's weekend? So we are, we're gonna have to do teams soon. Um, so start thinking about your teams. And I don't know how many people we're gonna do. I mean, we could just do like row, row, row or something. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure out teams. Um, what's up, JP? But historically, the class only ever had eight people in it. Year after year after year, it was eight people. And so we would do team one versus team two, and then you get really cutthroat. The first time we ever did it, some of you know some of these people. I don't know, Alexis, um, she's off in Illinois now. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, and then we did it again. Um, so it was, it was team one versus team two. We only had eight people. And then the grad program started to grow a little bit, and we did three uh, teams of four. And then now we're bigger. And so I don't know, we did it uh, three teams last time, but we, I don't know how we didn't make it very far into the semester. Um, that was like the last day of the semester or something on the, on the board over there. So I, I don't know how we're going to do teams, but maybe three teams and they'll be big or four teams and they'll be a little bit smaller. Let's start thinking about it because on Friday we have our first team event. So who you want to be on your team, our first competition is this Friday and it's going to be using the stuff that we're doing today, which isn't exciting. But it's just, it's, it's more sort of prereq to get into the exciting stuff. Some of the, the, and maybe some people are interested in it, but it's a little bit boring of a subject to say, people come to you, right? It's a client, you're at a PT clinic and it's the patient, um, your personal trainer is the client, um, whoever it is, your, your parents come to you seeking advice for how to improve. And blanket advice, we're so far past the age in which blanket advice is uh, meaningful or safe or effective or something other than negligent, right? Blanket advice is a soft form of negligence. And you have to consider the person, consider the person who's asking uh, you to train them or, you know, whatever, recuperate them if it's some, if it's some injury. Um, and so that's today is how do we appraise people so that we can move forward in a safe way? The appraisal comes first, and then we move forward. And as we move forward, we'll get into cooler stuff of you know how to actually employ physiology for whatever the goals are, gain muscle, get stronger, lose fat, whatever it is. We'll cover all of that stuff and the physiology, how to incorporate those uh, physiological tools. But the only stuff to know so far, and you don't need to know, the only three names, Herodicus, Hippocrates, and Galen, right? The three Greeks. Now we could say, um, so shrewd, we could say um, Confucius, other people who have also contributed to this idea that exercise is medicine, that in the history of medicine, what we see is physical activity. That if without physical activity, the, we just degrade, we atrophy, we degenerate, and, and we acquire this broadcast of illnesses and diseases and a premature death and whatever. All cause mortality visits those who don't get their physical activity. So that's the, the historical summary, BC, right? The BC years, the, the history of it, and well into the 80s or the common eras or whatever. Um, and those three were sort of the foundation um, the lineage of exercise is a, kind of a literal lineage from Herodicus to Hippocrates, the mentor of uh, Hippocrates. Galen lasted a really long time. Barber surgeons, remember around uh, AD 1000 or so, uh, barbers start doing a lot of these basic surgeries because doctors, doctors had no interest, sort of the physicians and more of an elite class had no interest in the gruesome cutting of flesh. Like, let's just get blood all over the place and it's just sort of grotesque, like might as well be on a battlefield stuff. Um, you know, the scalpel and the sword, nah, it's two about the same, one's a little version of the other. Uh, so doctors weren't doing that, barbers were doing a lot of that stuff. Um, and then, you know, algebra and algorithms and alcohol and the numbers and all stuff. But Islamic golden age, uh, Baghdad was the intellectual capital of the world, um, lasted for century after century after century, and then it declined. There was a decline. Um, and culturally, we see different cultures throughout the world valuing the sciences and the advancement, whether it's 
you know, navigation or mathematics, you know, astronomy, medicine, agriculture, just name a field. And there are these cultural movements uh, in which that field has advanced very rapidly. But the Islamic Golden Age is one of those periods. Now, all this is saying for this whole paragraph right here is cardiovascular physiology. I mean, go back to the 1500s, 16th century, right? And everyone cared. Everyone cared about cardiovascular physiology. What the heart is a weird thing that just goes and goes and goes. Like an Indiana Jones movie, like you rip it out of the chest and it's still beating, right? It should be beating a little bit uh, faster because it has no parasympathetic um, slowing effects. But, uh, but we've, we've been studying cardiovascular physiology for an awfully long time. It's not just the liver making blood, sending it to the tissues, to the metabolically active tissues where it's absorbed forever and then the liver has to make more. Um, figuring out how the closed system works. Ah, we've been at it for a really long time. Muscle physiology, human performance physiology, whether it's athletics, um, to enhancement of physical functioning, stuff like that. That's younger. That, that's, there's, there's a youth uh, to that field. Um, whereas warding off disease, warding off illness, trying to cure whatever ails us, that's the old stuff. And, and the heart is an, is an area where we often find ailments. Skeletal muscle, nobody really cared for, for a particular long, unless you're a gladiator. Um, war, just remember war, this is one of the biggest drivers for research. I mean, research in like physics also, and, and research in, you know, technology, but research in human performance. If you go to Massachusetts, native Massachusetts, there's this place called Eucerium, uh, the United States Arium Army, research something like environmental institute I mean, you know yeah um and uh that's where they do all this soldier this military soldier research and a lot of huge names have have come out of there if you go to research gate and just start going through human performance physiology you know william kramer uh maria urso uh lawrence armstrong you go down this list of huge names and they all had this appointment at eucerium for a while where they're doing military research because soldiers need to be the best athletes if you're going to have a country that you know politically thrives or, or whatever and so institutional review boards back off a little bit when you're dealing with soldiers Oh, well, what percentage of them are going to die? No more than 20. All right, you can run the experiment. It's not that extreme, but it's, it's a lot more extreme than if you try to run something here. If you try to run a study on campus at Pacific, it's like, well, blood alcohol content is going to get up to 0.08. Oh, good luck getting that cleared. See, it gets tough. We will eventually get that exact thing cleared, but it gets tough in an institutional review board at a university to get research cleared. For war, like, we'll do anything. Like, you know, 10% of people are probably going to have heat stroke. Okay, just get the ice baths ready and run, and run the study. Um, so the goals of exercise and engagement, this is just like looks, performance, um, injury, you know, recovery, recuperation, and longevity. Really those four, and, and you divide them up in different ways. And then just those explosions of exercise physiology, just every marketable thing that's ever happened counts for that stuff. Um, so what makes, what advances us, either in pop culture, it could be just some ephemeral thing in pop culture, um, Billy Blank's kickboxing kind of, you know, the cardio kickboxing stuff, or um, some scientific movement, anything like that, this, this um, momentous uh, growth of health and exercise science. So um, where it goes wrong, some of you have seen this, this before. This is Peg Chicoella, Dr. Chicoella right there. Um, this was her article. She brought uh, Van Ness on board and then Tommy Boone. Um, he's in the College of St. Scholastica, whatever. But uh, so this was really Peg's article. And she was talking about when things go badly, when you just approach a situation with blanket advice. It says, I'm going to prescribe exercise however I decide it works regardless of the client, right? And so what happened was, this is in 2002. So this is like, you know, Peg has her JD, her law degree also. So she combines physiology and law and the stuff that she publishes. And there was this guy, Ross Dye, 
who went to a gym, I think it was a Gold's gym and hired a personal trainer. You pay a lot of money for a personal trainer. It's a lot of money to hire a plumber. Right? To get a plumber to come out to your house, you expect the plumber to know all about your pipes. You know, wherever the pipes and tubes and all that stuff goes, the plumber should know the stuff and be able to fix it without you know, destroying your bathroom or your sink in your kitchen or whatever it is. You expect the same from a personal trainer. You hire a personal trainer, you pay that person like plumbing wages, which is high, and you expect them to know about your pipes and your tubing and your innards so that you don't overflow in really you know, lethal and tragic ways. So this guy, Ross, I go to this gym, hires this, this trainer, and the trainer just puts him through this really intense exercise program. Did not appraise Ross Dye, this guy first, didn't sit him down and say, all right, first session, I'll have you walk on the treadmill a little bit, we'll do some chatting, right? maybe do a little stretching, you know, I'm gonna have you do some light stuff, um, internal, external rotation, something like that. We'll just put the, the joints through some range of motion to see what your limitations are. Let me know how sore you are the next day. And throughout the session, why don't we chat about your family history? Throughout the session, uh, I'm gonna throw a tape measure around your waist. I'm gonna have you stand on a scale. Uh, I'm gonna ask you about your blood pressure if I don't take it. I'm gonna ask you about your cholesterol because I probably won't take it. I'm going to ask you if you know, if you have a history, if there's, if there's some sort of history of, of diabetes uh, in your own medical charts or in your, in your lineage, right? Let's, let's go back to Ma and Pa. Um, do you have siblings who died of a heart attack? You have to, you have to ask all these questions because if you don't have the answers, you risk what happened. Just make the guy exercise really hard. This is a description. This is all I've just taken from the article. And these are quotations that came out in court. Peg here, this is Peg down here, <laughs> being very festive. Um, and, and so these are quotations that came out in, in court. The guy, the trainer's just putting through all these things with having no idea if he's capable of tolerating this. The guy has never exercised before. He's overweight. He's this older, overweight guy who's never exercised before. And who knows what his blood pressure was? Who knows what his cholesterol was? Who knows what his blood sugar was? You know, because nobody ever asked him. And he's telling the guy, he's like, look, I need to take a break. I am so far out of breath and I can't catch it. I lost breath a while ago and catching it seems to be impossible. I have to stop. And I'm not gonna read this out loud, but read the last line. That's, what they, that's a quotation, that's the second to last line. Um, that's what the trainer said to him. That's a quotation from court. And then down here, read the last line here. Again, when he says like, I cannot do anymore and he stops, you read the last line. To yourself so I don't have to read it out loud. That is a quotation that the trainer said that was documented in court to this guy who was having a heart attack. The guy was having a heart attack at the time and that's what the trainer said. And, you know, so you try to push through, push through, whatever. The guy ended up getting surgery, a couple coronary stents put in um, and he sues and like Right, you should sue. You go hire, okay, like imagine you hire the plumber and the plumber comes in, all you say is like, man, this toilet, like I pee in it and it overflows. I don't know what's, there must be something wrong in the tubes, the pipes, there's a hole there. And then down beneath the hole, something is messed up because I pee and then like I flush and it goes everywhere. So you like, you call the plumber and the plumber's like, oh yeah, yeah okay. And he comes in with like a sledgehammer and just busts up your sink and then leaves. That's the same, that's like, that's much, I would rather have that than, you know, die. Um, but that's a similar concept um, to what happened. But it turns out this guy was a certified personal trainer. He had a certification. He's a certified personal trainer through AMFPT. Here's the website. I pulled it up. Um, to this day, I, I checked it this morning. I went to amfpt.com. You can go to it too. Um, and this exact same is who qualifies. It's the exact same page, except it still says copyright 2011, um, except his face is gone. But when I pulled this up and took the screenshot, his face was like mobile in a super creepy way. He would like move around and his lips would move and stuff. Um, but I think since it's such a scam, it's such a for-profit scam, that the guy's like, you know, I don't want my face. I don't even know I'm the one doing this. I don't want to go to the grocery store and have people like shove eggs and pie in my face. So take that off of the website to keep everything else up. So that still exists. That website, that certification, anyone in this room 
you can get certified by the end of the day by a professional certifying agency. By the time you go to bed tonight, you can be, you too can be a certified personal trainer and like, let's quote some of this stuff. It's a surefire way to start your career off on the right foot. Just a bunch of platitudes, a bunch of cliches and platitudes. And, and you know, if you have experienced, uh, if you have exercised and experiment, experimented with dieting yourself, you have the ability to be a trainer. I mean, this is crazy. Um, but personal training, working with bodies outside of a hospital setting, outside of a, uh, the, the clinician's establishment, you're an OT, you're a PT, um, you're a doctor, you're whatever. Outside of that, do whatever you want to bodies because there's no licensing agency, right? There's only a certification, which is just sort of silly. Um, but if you want to go into cosmetology, welcome to, this is a .gov website. I pulled this up this morning. At ca.gov, right? Welcome to the California Board of Barbering and Cosmetology. You have to be cert you have to um, have a license. That's not a certification. That's a license. You can't do it without your license. Personal training, go for it. Just do whatever you want. There's no license necessary. Get as many certifications as you want. Those are all just kind of hilarious. But even the ones that people have esteem for, NASM, stuff like that, they're for profit, just like this, but they've been around a little bit longer. There's a little bit more money behind them. There's some um, nonprofits that, that do it right. Um, ACSM, obviously. CSCS, um, Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist. Um, ACE, American Council on Exercise, has been around since 85, they've been right. But we don't have licensing for, for personal trainers. So anyone can do it, and lots of people. Today, probably before I finish this sentence, certainly before we finish this lecture, someone is going to have an adverse event of some kind because the personal trainer was an idiot, because they didn't do appropriate pre-screening before working with the person. And you really have to do it with athletics too. Um, there's a lot of athletes uh, that will have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, something like this. Sudden cardiac death happens all, sort of, all the time. Um, that'd be like saying people are struck by lightning all the time. But, but it happens with a frequency that is worrying enough that you have to screen people uh, for this stuff. Um, and so this is, we're now in like Dr. Chickalella form, and it's cheap. It's a great conclusion. Um, it is possible uh, that Rostai reached his conclusions based upon inadequate or unpersuasive evidence. The court's failure, so the court ruled in favor of the trainer because it's like, I don't know, personal training isn't real. That's what the court said in slightly different words, but they're like, personal training is just like a thing you do as a hobby. It's not a real job. So there's no license. There's no oversight. The government can't step in. The law can't step in. You can just, as long as you as long as the bullet, it didn't go through the heart. Who cares? That's the government's uh, view of personal training. And it's a horrible one. We need to fix it, but that's what the government said. So it is possible that Ross I reaches conclusions based on inadequate or unpersuasive evidence. The court's failure to recognize the most rudimentary principles of exercise as medicine, what we've been talking about, um, is stunning to the professional exercise physiologist. The court erroneously concluded that vigorous exercise is necessary to achieve fitness. We'll talk about that today, not true. Um, is necessary to achieve uh, fitness. Failed to properly distinguish skeletal and cardiac muscle, hugely important, right? We've been studying cardiac muscle, very uh, detailed since the 16th century expressed a decided lack of understanding of overload or minimal thresholds to achieve a training effect, keeping light or moderate intensities uh, and that overload principle gradually you increase. We'll talk about that later today. Inappropriately defined the purpose of training and failed to acknowledge disparate risks of exercise in the young versus middle age. So that's another risk factor I will talk about as age. Misunderstanding on these issues is at odds with the protection of public health. Resolution, is as much an, an educational as a legal issue and is incumbent upon the profession of exercise physiology to dedicate resources to the implementation of a strategy that will offer a remedy. Until that time, the public will remain at risk when trainers have no standard of care to which they are legally obligated. Um, so that is, those are the stakes. The stakes are you work with bodies, bodies are fragile. Some bodies are more fragile than others. And lots of, bo every body eventually dies. Some of them can be hastened to their demise with inappropriate use of the stuff that we'll be talking about in this class. Now, later in the semester, 
I'm just going to be talking about when we get to like mTOR, it's like, how do you make a muscle grow with physiology? And it's just like, go, 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 go. We have this in the back of our minds, right? When, when I'm saying like, here's what you can do to maximize muscle growth with the use of physiological principles and, and scientific tools. We have this in the back of our mind because it's not going to be in the front of your mind because I won't talk about it since this lecture. But don't forget it. Don't lose track of this because if you lose track of this, people literally die, not figuratively or whimsically or whatever. Literally, people die. Um, so this is the latest edition. It's copyright next year. We're not even there yet. So this one just came out. And I put all of the relevant in, in the latest announcements on Canvas, I put all of the relevant uh, tables, the relevant information from chapter two from this book has been uploaded. So you, you can see those tables, you can have them with you. Uh, now, the way a lot of people will assess injury, you know, colleges, whatever, is you just do the parkio, the physical activity readiness questionnaire. Um, and this is the latest one, the 2021. Um, it's just like, you know, does your doctor say you have a heart problem, right? Do you feel pain in your chest at rest? or when you're exercising, right? Do you lose balance because you're dizzy? It's, it's asking these big questions where if you have one of these, go see your doctor. You know, don't just go kick the ball around on the soccer field, like, oh, I'll get to it later. Like, well, let me, let me play a few rounds of tennis first and then, you know, um, go see your doctor if you're having one of these huge problems. But the part Q is, you know how health insurance companies, they just say like, what's your height and weight? they're not gonna go, let's put you in a DEXA and let's get your body composition. And then I also wanna know what your cholesterol is. And, and then we'll come up with some predictive model about how much to charge you for health insurance. They don't do that. They just say the height and weight. And even when I was doing it, like in my old bodybuilding days, um, I would lie, because it's on the phone, they're not looking at me. I would just say my weight is a lot lighter than it was because my body fat percent was very low. And so I'd say a weight that corresponded to what my body fat percent was. I weighed 240 at the time, but I think I would say like I was 190 or something because I didn't want this outrageous health insurance that didn't really apply to me because the height and weight thing. So the PARQ is a way of doing that. Now there are other organizations, there are other agencies that, that are going to rate or rank risk differently. So the American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehabilitation their risk. And this is a lot of like, what's your left ventricular ejection fraction? How many people in this room know their own ejection fraction? I could go look it up for my labs probably, but like, I don't know it off the top of my head, you know? Uh, and so it's a lot of these things, uh, it, it's not practical, right? This isn't quite practical um, if you're going to work with somebody outside of a hospital setting, right? If you're working inpatient and you're doing cardiac rehab and people who, you know, they just had their heart surgery and they send them to you to walk on a treadmill. Cardi you guys should get into cardiac rehab if you're just looking for a job. It's decent pay and you just chat with people while they're walking on treadmills. And it counts as all of your observation hours. I know people who have done that and loved it for a couple of years. Um, as a stepping stone, right? As a, as a way of getting somewhere else. But in that setting, yeah, this is fine in that setting, in cardiac rehab or something. But if you're working with personal training clients or athletes or, or some community health program, something like that, you're not going to know anyone's ejection fraction, right? So this is a quotation from the book, from chapter two. And basically what it says is we're trying to avoid what happened to Ross Dye. We're trying to avoid heart attacks. Um, sudden cardiac death, acute myocardial infarction, right, heart attack. We're trying to avoid these things. What associates with an elevated risk? Well, if the people were already, because during exercise, remember, well, that's the most lethal thing that you can do to your body. I guess like heroin and a big dose. You get what I'm saying? If, if there's some sort of activity, some legal like normal activity, uh, Exercise is one of the scariest things your body can endure. One of the most threatening things to your health and your ongoing existence. So uh, during vigorous exercise, do you have a history of this? Have you been doing vigorous exercise a lot over the past year 
over the past life, over the past six months, whatever. Are you a vigorous creature? Yes or no. Um, if you're already doing vigorous activity, you probably can tolerate it. So that's a really important thing to look at. And then the other most important thing is, are there signs? Are there symptoms? Is there a diagnosis? Is there evidence of cardiovascular disease? Is there evidence of metabolic disease? Um, kidney, renal disease. Uh, pulmonary comes and goes in these things. Um, the ninth edition had a lot of commentary on COPD and asthma, less commentary here. Uh, but one CVD risk factor, cardiovascular disease, CVD risk factor, doesn't really matter that much on its own. It's not that noisy on its own. If you start collecting a lot of these things, if you start accumulating a lot of risk factors, now it's worth paying attention to them. Um, but the things that are most important are going to be those disease states, right? It's going to be, you know, coronary artery disease. You know, you have a history of a heart attack and something like that. Those are the really big, important ones. Um, the risk factors we'll talk about are associated with um, acute adverse episodes less, but they're still predictive. They're just weaker. So the stuff to really pay attention to is current physical activity level. What do people do? You're going to work with the body. What do they do? What's the current level of physical activity engagement? Um, signs and symptoms of disease. In particular, kidney, metabolic, you know, diabetes, something like that, um, and cardiovascular. And then people who have a diagnosis of those things, not just signs and symptoms, but the doctor has previously, you know, documented uh, diagnosis. And, um, and then looking at what they want to do. Do you want to just take the dog for a walk? Do you want to take the dog for a sprint? Do you want to do resistance training? Figuring out what they want to do with their body. So how risky is that body? And what level of exertion are they going to push it to? So all of these tables, the next bunch of slides, are in that PDF that's connected to the announcement in Canvas. So you have all this stuff and you'll need it um, to download it or whatever. You know where to find it if you don't download it. Uh, but stuff to sit across the table and ask the person, right? If they have pain or discomfort, just like a chest pain. Um, and you can phrase this in a million different ways, but, but you know, during um, exertion, right? You're, you're going to go start exercising a little bit. Is there any, you know, sensitivity here? Are we feeling a, a bit of a, um, you know, a burning, a heaviness, a heavy feeling? Where if you're getting an ischemic effect, coronary artery disease, what are the coronary arteries? Yeah, arteries around the heart, coronation crown, they crown the heart, right? Um, so they crown, coronation, they crown the heart, the coronary arteries. The heart's a muscle, right? And it needs its own blood, so it pumps the coronary arteries, apply it to itself. If you have coronary artery disease, these are some of the feelings you're going to have. Why don't we be cautious here? Why, why don't we get uh, medical clearance? Shortness of breath. Um, at rest or with mild exertion, uh, dyspnea. Um, so just if you can't catch your breath, Rasta, that I cannot catch my breath. I'm here, my breath is not being caught no matter what I do. Um, that shortness of breath with mild exertion, um, dizziness or syncope. Now, sometimes people will pass out after, and that's usually, usually normal-ish. Um, so if you go do something really difficult, some really high intensity thing and your heart's going crazy and you're just going to win gate or something and you got to lock your knees. Right, down you go. That's not, I mean, maybe the, the head trauma when you fall, you need to be seen, but you don't need to be like, go to the doctor for that. Um, if there's some sort of uh, vasovagal syncope, like you see something super gross and you pass out or you're standing in the choir bleachers or whatever for a long time, you pass out, those are all normal. That's just what a body does, like blood pools, um, venous insufficiency, maybe a little bit. You just, you're not using the skeletal muscle pump to get all that blood back in there. Uh, but dizziness or syncope, syncope like passing out um, during exercise, that's probably a problem. And so document that one. Um, 
so if you um, or thapnea, um, if you are lying down, just lie down on your back, go to bed at night, get in the recliner or whatever, lie down. And if, if that gives you breathing problems, there's several questions about pnea, right? about, about uh, ventilatory, respiratory things. Um, and so if you have breathing problems of any kind, not document that either while sleeping or while kind of reclining, lying on your back. Um, ankle edema, right? If you have, if your ankles, especially at night, if your ankles get um, get swollen, you have big ankles at night, worry a little bit. Worry a little bit about that. Uh, write it down. Certainly, if it's if it's in a client or a patient. Uh, palpitations or tachycardia. You guys know tachycardia and bradycardia. The palpitations that we just notice like this stuff. It might be fine, might be normal. You know, it, it, it could be a problem to note. So definitely note it. Um, if there's palpitations, if there's tachycardia. Um, now it could just be some stress response or something. If it's just a little bit panic attacky or something like, okay, you know your own body. So if you're talking to somebody and they say, yeah, no, I do get like rapid heart rate, um, but I have PTSD. It's like, okay, well, we know there's a culprit here. We know there's a cause. Um, but if it's just some weird thing, intermittent claudication, this is if people exercise and like their lower limbs, they, they start feeling some pain. That's what this is. And um, probably coronary artery disease is probably a form of heart disease. And, and so, you know, write that one down. Not just like, oh, I exercise and man, I'm sore, but that's not it. Um, you know, I sprained my ankle and it hurt, but that's not it, right? It's, it is, um, you know, atherosclerosis or a heart condition and you, you exercise, you exert yourself and then that's when you feel it and it does dissipate. So those are all the things you'd have to write down as the signs and symptoms of disease. Oh, and we're on known heart murmur. Well, I guess there's one more after that. So there's a no, you know, the love dub is not loving and dubbing, right? Um, and then another shortness of breath one, but that's like, whatever, shortness of breath. If your breath is not your friend, if your breath is not companionable when you go out for an activity or when you're lying down, something like that, definitely mark that one. Now, here's how you rank them. Here's how you stratify people. There are six possible sites where people can land, where your patient or your client, your person, where they can land. There are six sites. If they do not participate, in regular exercise, it's going to be one of these three. Um, the next slide will have if they do participate, and these tables are in that PDF that you have. So if there's no um, cardiovascular, if there's no disease, right, and um, no signs or symptoms, anything like that, feel free. You don't need medical clearance. Feel free to start with moderate and, and you know progress to intense unless something changes, unless something goes wrong, you can progress to a more intense um, exercise plan without your doctor, you know, hovering over your shoulder the whole time. So that's if there's no signs, no symptoms, no diagnosis. If there is a diagnosis, but people don't have any signs or symptoms, asymptomatic, like, well, I was diagnosed with this thing once upon a time, but, you know, who would know? I've never felt anything or whatever. Um, get medical clearance, um, but you, know, have them, you don't need to worry too much. There's not too much concern. Have them start light, go moderate, and then if everything's going right, you can progress you know, according to, to a reasonable uh, duration, get them into uh, more vigorous stuff. If there's any signs or symptoms, you know, they have the ankle edema, they're breathing, the heart, whatever. If there's any of this stuff, uh, medical clearance, and after medical clearance, I wouldn't do anything vigorous ever. Um, but light exercise, taking the dog for a walk, stuff like that, definitely have them do a bunch of that because otherwise, if they just stop physical exertion forever, the deterioration is so much more rapid. Like, you know when somebody breaks a hip, an older person breaks a hip and they were just thriving intellectually, um, socially, and in all other, you know, anthropologically, whatever. They're, they're doing their thing, it's, it's, it's going well. They break their hip and like a week later, they don't know your name. All the, again, it's gonna, that's going to happen while we're you know, on this slide. That's going to happen to someone. It's a tragedy every time. The reason is the lack of physical activity. You do the same thing, just you know, have forced bed rest. 
I have a book upstairs where people are studying bed rest. I mean, this is from like the 50s or something. People are studying the consequences of bed rest. This is tough. If you just lie there all day and you have no exertion, the body breaks down and the brain follows. So we'll talk all about the um, brain and, and exertion and, and their relationship soon. So that's if you don't participate in exercise. If people are already regular routine exercisers, um, and there's just nothing wrong with them. Do whatever you want. Yeah, you just have them do vigorous and who cares? You're fine. Just do any, like don't crash cars. Other than that, you're probably safe. Um, if you have a known metabolic condition, a cardiovascular, you know, whatever, some known disease, but no symptoms, right? There's no symptoms. There's no outwards or overt signs of any of this. Uh, they can continue with whatever they're doing. Be careful. Right, just just be a little bit more mindful of, of any symptoms. Pay attention. Um, you know, have some self reflection. Uh, medical clearance isn't necessary. You're already exercising. Just keep going. You don't need to go show up at the at the doctor yet. If you're going to switch into something very vigorous, go see the doctor at that point. It's like, well, you know, I've been doing my thing for the last six months or year, but I think I'm going to do an Ironman. Well, okay, now now go check out the doctor. Um, but until then, you don't need to. If people have been exercising, if they've been consistently exercising, and yet they have signs and symptoms. Okay, go ahead and stop exercising at this point. Discontinue, which just means stop. I don't know why people need that many syllables for. Um, and then go seek medical clearance at that point to make sure it's safe, because some people will be exercising and it's just a ticking time bomb. And you don't want that thing to go off. And it hasn't gone off yet, thankfully but why don't we get you into the doctor's office now just to make sure we're gonna be okay. Uh, and then over here, this, this is just the definitions of you know, exercise, what light is, what moderate is, it doesn't really matter. So this would be an easy way of going through it. Again, this is in that, uh, the, there's a PDF in Canvas. And you know, step one, does your client experience you know, chest discomfort, you know, breathlessness, ankle swelling, stuff like that. Um, step two, uh, are they physically active? And there's a definition of physical activity for at least three months, whatever, you know, yes or no. They're physically active, yes. They're not physically active. Um, and then medical conditions, so the health history. And you're checking off that stuff. So that's how you'd end up stratifying all of these things. Okay, we're gonna do case studies, you're gonna count it up. So remember, these are the, these are the questions to answer in these case studies. Um, do they participate in regular exercise, yes or no? And just ball, you don't need to know specific definitions of these things. Ballparks are, are okay. Uh, known cardiovascular, metabolic, or renal disease. Any signs or symptoms that would suggest disease? Signs or symptoms mean this disease is sort of rearing its head. It's not just some dormant thing that's, that, you know, the sleeping dragon stuff. Um, are they expecting to do vigorous activity? So, those four questions. A 50-year-old non-smoking male was recently invited by colleagues to participate in a 10 K trail run. Currently, he walks at a moderate intensity for 40 minutes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, something he has done for years. His goal is to run the entire race without stopping, and he is seeking training services. He reports having what he describes as a mild heart attack at age 45, completed cardiac rehabilitation, that's the walk on treadmill stuff, and has had no problems since. He takes a statin, um, an ACE inhibitor, and aspirin daily during the last visit with his cardiologist, which took place two years ago, the cardiologist noted no changes in his medical condition. Regular participation exercise. Mm, yes. Yeah. Known cardiovascular metabolic or renal disease? Yeah. Yes. Um, signs or symptoms that would suggest disease? No. Not currently. Um, is he expecting to do vigorous? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, case stay tuned. Um, 22 year old recent college graduate is joining a gym since becoming an accountant six months ago. She no longer walks across campus or plays intramural soccer and has concerns about her now sedentary lifestyle. Although her body mass index is slightly above normal, she reports no significant medical history and no symptoms of any disease. Uh, even when walking up three flights of stairs to her apartment, she would like to begin playing golf. Regular participation exercise? No. no. Any cardiovascular or whatever disease? No. no. Signs or symptoms of anything? No. no. Want to do vigorous? No. I don't think golf. I could be wrong, yeah. but um, 
speed golf or something. I don't know. Um, so yeah, have at it. Go play your golf. Uh, number three, I think it's four or five of these. A 45 year old former collegiate swimmer turned avid lifelong triathlete uh, who trains at least 60 minutes a day, six days a week, requests assistance with run training. Uh, his only significant medical history is a series of overuse injuries to his shoulders and Achilles tendon. In recent weeks, he notes his vigorous intensity workouts are unusually difficult and reports feeling constriction in his chest with exertion, something he attributes to deficiencies in core strength. Upon further questioning, he explains that the chest constriction is improved with rest and that he often feels dizzy during recovery. Participate in regular physical activity? Yes. Known cardiovascular bubble or diagnosis? No. Signs of symptoms? Yes. Wants to do vigorous? Yes. So I've got to be a little bit cautious with that one since, again, the disease state is active. It's present. He's having um, dizziness. Um, he's having um, uh, some sort of chest pain that could very likely be um, coronary artery disease. You know, so, so there are conditions to worry about. Number four, a 60-year-old woman is beginning a professionally-led walking program. Two years ago, she had a drug-eluting stent uh, placed in her left anterior descending coronary artery after a routine exercise stress test revealed significant ST segment depression. She completed a brief cardiac rehabilitation program in the two months following the procedure, but has been inactive since. She reports no signs or symptoms and takes a cholesterol lowering statin and antiplatelet medications uh, as directed by her cardiologist. Regular participation in exercise? No. no. No cardiovascular, metabolic, or renal disease? Yes. 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 Signs or symptoms? Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and is she expecting to do anything vigorous? No. Walking? I don't think so. If, if, you know, professionally led walking program. I mean, it depends what the, you know, pitch is. Like, are we going to like 18 grade or something? I'm not sure, but, but probably not vigorous. Last one. A 35-year-old business consultant is in town for two weeks and seeking a temporary membership at a fitness club. She and her friends have been training at a moderate to vigorous intensity for a long distance charity bike ride for the past 16 weeks. She's unable to travel with her bike and she does not want to lose her fitness. She reports no current symptoms of cardiovascular or metabolic disease and has no medical history except hyperlipidemia for which she takes a cholesterol lowering statin daily. So regular participation exercise? Yes. Yes. Known anything, diagnoses? Nah. Signs of symptoms? No. Nah. Um, now, hyperlipidemia, uh, who sort of, who cares? Well, we'll talk about that um, in just a minute. Um, and is she um, expecting to do something vigorous? Yeah, but she already is, right? So, um, so for that one, uh, for that last one, you know, vigorous, whatever, there's no to everything um, and yes to exercise, but those are just the answers. Uh, so on the, on the exam, when that comes around, I'll put a couple of case studies on it, but on Friday, we're going to compete against each other in groups on case studies where you have to trick your opponents, your opposing teams. You have to write a case study that's going to trick them. So if there are, um, say, three groups, four groups, so there's going to be three or four case studies, and you have to do this to it. But there's one more thing you have to do to it, which is this table. This is identifying the number of um, risk factors. Now, risk factors are different. The other one is signs and symptoms or a diagnosis of disease, right? Known disease. Risk factors are things like, do you smoke? That's not a disease, right? That's just, that elevates risk. And more it elevates chronic risk, chronic risk as opposed to acute myocardial infarction. But over time, the likelihood of, of an adverse event is increasing with these things. Um, BMI or waist circumference, some measurement of obesity, that's a risk, that's not, that's not disease, right? That's not like you have a heart condition or something like that. Being sedentary, a family history of disease, not in yourself, but in part of your genome, somebody you know had, a, had an event. Um, blood glucose, so just from the top. Age, women have a buffer. Uh, over 55, and that's a, that's a mark against you. For guys, it's over 45. Um, now, a family history, just add 10 years to that. For guys now, it's do you have a, a family member, um, a male family member who is um, younger than age 55 who had an adverse event? 
um, or for females, um, 65. So that's family history. Cigarette smoking, just do you smoke or do you inhale a lot of other people's smoke? Um, physical inactivity, who cares about the numbers? Just is somebody sedentary? We have a good gauge on that. Is this person sedentary, yes or no? We can, we can gauge that pretty well. Um, body mass index, just a BMI of 30 is the cutoff. If you wanna do waist circumference, uh, it's 102 or 88 for guys and females respectively. Who cares, just, you just use 30, because 30 as um, a BMI is the cutoff for obese, and that's for uh, males and females. Blood pressure, this changes over the years, it's now more conservative. It used to be 140 and 90. Um, that, that was uh, stage one hypertension, your systolic is 140 or higher, your diastolic is 90 or higher, uh, and now it's 130 or 80. So that, those numbers are getting um, closer and closer to normal. But not just a one-off. You don't just sit down, get your blood pressure taken once, and then say, ooh, I have hypertension. So well, you stressed, or you slept badly, or you just walked here, or you, there's a million things it could be. So um, on different occasions, entirely different occasions, not like, whoa, let's wait a minute and take it again. That's, I, I'm the same person in the same circumstances I just had 60 more seconds to sit here. It's not gonna change that much, right? Um, so multiple occasions, um, you're, you're seeing you know, over 130, over 80. Okay, okay, well, let's count blood pressure. Um, the lipids, just cholesterol. If your total cholesterol is 200 or higher, that counts. But if you know the HDLs and LDLs, ignore total cholesterol. Total cholesterol is sort of a pointless number if you know uh, HDLs and LDLs. And for LDLs, 130. If you hit 130, you go higher. That's, that's a risk factor. Um, and then if your HDLs um, are, you know, for women and for men, it's a little bit different. Um, for women, it is below 50. For, for men, it's below 40. If you have low HDLs, you don't need to remember those exact numbers. But LDLs, 130, write that down. Or you have this. This is in the, this is in the PDF. Um, blood glucose, if it's between 100 and 126, that's considered pre-diabetes. That's fasted. You wake up first thing in the morning and, and check your blood sugar. Um, that's pre-diabetes. If you hit 126, that's diabetes. That's a diagnosis. 100 to 125, that's considered pre-diabetes. If you're like 94, wonderful. If you're 92, wonderful. If you're 80, wonderful, whatever. Um, get over 100 and people start paying attention to it, but just sleep badly or get really stressed out, have a bunch of cortisol, have it, your blood sugar, your fasting blood sugar is gonna go way up. Um, so this is over time, you know, multiple, multiple tests. One test really reveals remarkably little uh, in the human form because we're so adaptable. Um, we, we change to the circumstances. Okay, now we're gonna do four more case studies, but this is strictly for how the number of risk factors that people have. Okay, we, we can just smoke up, we smoke, we, we can, I'll circle that one already. We can circle them as we go. Um, so a female, age 21, smokes on weekends, drinks alcohol, you know, one or two nights a week, usually on weekends. Uh, her BMI is, is 22, her resting heart rate 76, uh, blood pressure is 118 over 72, total cholesterol is 178, and LDL is 98, HDL is 62. Um, fasted blood glucose is 96. She's on oral contraceptives, attends a 45 minute moderate intensity group exercise class uh, two or three times a week, no family history. Okay, so we already circled smoking, right? Um, now, if you look down here, negative risk factors, HDL greater than equal to 60. And you look over here, what was hers? 62. 62. So a negative risk factor means this is one and this is negative one. So she has zero risk factors. So that's how you sum hers up. And when you're writing your own case studies to trick each other, um, the person who tricks the most and is tricked the least wins the team um, that, that conducts the most trickery and falls for the least of it. Uh, is the winner, extra credit and bragging rights. 
Um, so this is sort of how to, how to do it, is you're gonna have to add up the number of risk factors and you can make it a little bit tricky. So male, age 45, some randomized controlled trial. Like, all right, we're going to with statins, we're going to manipulate whatever. Uh, and so I'm unfamiliar with the research. Mm -hmm. Really good question, though. Uh, so what Nathaniel was asking is, why are men and women different with their HDL ratings? In terms of you know, risk factors, you know, like, why don't, just like with BMI is 30, right? Why, why is there a difference um, in HDLs? You know, but there's a difference of 102 and 88 with the waist circumference. There must be some epidemiological finding that associates with an elevated risk, but I'm unsure. Uh, so this one would be three, right? Own age, HDLs, um, family history. So that person would have three, unless we missed something, but I don't think we did. Oh, uh, second to last one. Man, age 44, now this gets a little bit. Okay. He's 44 and 360 days old or something like, okay. And then the next person just had his 45th birthday. Like you have to draw a line somewhere. You know what is, I mean, this is, you know, in statistics, we talk about the P value of 0 0.05. Well, what's the difference between 0 0.0499999 and 0 0.05001? From a practical perspective, exactly nothing. There's no difference here. Um, but you have to draw a line somewhere. But like if you're, I don't know, if you go to like Harry Potter 9 comes out and there's a line, right? And everyone's waiting in line. At some point the seats fill and you're standing in line you're like, sorry, or, or like American Idol or something like, sorry, you don't get to sing today. Well, come on, I waited in line for like 12 hours and the person in front of me went, gotta draw a line somewhere, you know? And so it, that, that's age 44, it's the same thing, but that's not a risk. So man, age 44, non-smoker, um, BMI of 31, it's too high. Yeah, we crossed the 30 there. Resting heart rate of 62, uh, blood pressure of 128 over 84. Good. Um, cholesterol of 184, LDL 106, HDL 44. Um, you just change the, the HDL one. So I actually have to like, was the HDL is 40? 40 for men and 50 yeah. for women. Okay, because that's a new, that was never a risk factor in the, in the earlier uh, editions. Um, so, HDL was never a risk factor? The HDL, the HDL has always been a negative risk factor with the 60. Yeah, so the two things, yeah, the two things that changed, um, and I just got, got all this yesterday. So it's a, it's a brand new book. Um, the two things that changed are the HDL is a risk factor and the blood pressure was, was brought down from 140 and 90 down to 130 and 80, that changed. Um, so was this one a risk factor? Oh, no. 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 Okay. Um, blood glucose, fasted blood glucose of 130. Yes. Yeah, that's diabetes. <laughs> um, so we're now at a high risk. 
here. That's a that's a diagnosis. Um, 126, we're, we're hitting diabetes. Um, reports that he does not have time to exercise. Yeah. Okay, there's another one. Um, father had type 2 diabetes and died at 67 of a heart attack. Would that be plus two? No, it was an age range. 67, if it was 65, yeah. you know, because um, it's, it's um, uh, for, it's 45 and 55 for your own self and 55 and 65 uh, for family history. So you just add 10 years to it. So we're actually, we're actually in the clear there. Uh, mother is living. So we have four, but one of those is a little bit more worrisome. When we see the fasted blood glucose of 130, that's a little bit more worrisome than a mere- Family uh, history of diabetes with his dad. Yeah, family history of diabetes with his dad, good one. Family history of diabetes with his dad and that 130, um, that's gonna be disease states more than mere, okay, let me stop one more. Uh, female, woman, age 36, non-smoker. Uh, her BMI is 18.5. Interesting about the 18.5. Oh, that's that's really lots of cutoff. 18.5 is a cutoff for being um, underweight, and so she's right there at that cutoff that could potentially be risky. Would you uh, say yes to that one then? I would not or... say yes to the 18.5. Let's go back unless they added something. They did, um, yeah. they did or didn't? They didn't. Okay. Um, yeah, so they, they didn't add anything for that, but it is that is a risky domain to be in. Weight gain is in her best interest. Um, so 18.5, because you know, again, the, that range of BMIs is healthiest, 24 to 26, something like that. If you want to live a really long time and be happy and stuff, 24, 26, so right in that um, high normal weight, low overweight, then underweight associates with, I mean, this is like worse than 30 probably, but um, but we're not counting as a risk factor here. Uh, resting heart rate is normal. Resting blood pressure, 142 over 86. Yeah. You just count it as one, um, even though systolic and diastolic are both elevated as one blood pressure. You know, the mean arterial pressure is just one thing. Um, total cholesterol, 174. Um, we do not have HDL and LDL. So we would use 200 as the cutoff and she doesn't cross that. Blood glucose is normal with insulin injections. If it's normal because you're doing drugs, that counts. Um, so insulin injections, she obviously has diabetes. Okay, so, okay type one diabetes, that's right here. Uh, type one diabetes, uh, diagnosed age seven. Uh, she teaches high intensity cardio kickboxing classes three times per week and walks at a moderate intensity for approximately 45 minutes, four times a week. Both parents are in good health. Um, so we have high blood pressure and diabetes is apparently very well controlled. Um, if she's exercising all the time and uh, her blood glucose is normal, that means she's controlling it very well. Uh, but so this is how you would do the number of risk factors, like zero, three, four, two. But some risk factors are more worrisome than others. Some risk, you know, if somebody, like if their blood pressure is 200 over 130, uh, let's not exercise at all, right? Yeah, but it's just a risk factor. Yeah, that's really outrageous though. Um, so, you know, if the blood pressure is um, 130 over 82, okay, I don't know. That's, that's not that big of a deal. Um, you know, if the, if the blood pressure is really high, same thing with blood sugar. If the blood sugar is 102, Okay, maybe you're stressed, maybe you're sleeping badly, what's your diet been like, how's your work situation, or, and let's get things under control and test your blood sugar again in four days and see what it is. Uh, if your blood sugar is 200, that's not stress, probably, it's a fasted blood sugar. Uh, and so there are gradations of these things, but knowing the categories is really helpful. So, yeah. So if, hypothetically, if someone were to write in their case study, uh, if someone had a BMI of under 18 and a half, would that be considered a risk factor even though it's technically not written like up there as a risk factor? Yeah, what I would do in answering the question for, for the case studies, and historically, you can do the case studies in a way, you don't have to provide the BMI, you can just provide the height and the weight, um, provide the weight and stones and the height and like cubits or something, <laughs> so you can convert it. Uh, but what I would do in answering that is I would say uh, BMI like zero and then put a little commentary about the risk associated 
uh, with being underweight. And I mean, you've all seen the graphs, but it, it gets even worse. Like, so it, it, like, so here's like 25. Yeah, that's the cross. I mean, here's 30, you know, it's 20, 15, whatever. And the rate of increase of disease does something like that. And it's just like, it shoots up, right? Because if you get too low, ah, that's bad. Now, part of it, part of it is people who are over here, why are they over there? Probably because they're struggling with, you know, HIV, cancer, things like that. That's probably the reason they're over there. If you are um, healthy and find yourself over there, separating that population from the people who arrived there owing to disease gets a little bit, it takes more statistical work. Um, but you just see this rapid increase in the onset of complications. Um, people who are underwent the osteoporosis, which isn't going to, that's not as, osteoporosis isn't as worrying as, you know, a heart condition in terms of go exercise. But I know multiple people who are in that really low zone and they broke their legs during exercise. The, their legs broke. I don't know exactly which bones because I wasn't there, uh, but they were hospitalized. Like I broke my leg. Again, I don't quite know what, there's a lot of stuff in the leg. Um, but they were, I don't know, their BMI was in the 18s, somewhere low 18s. Uh, and so you look at some of these consequences of, you know, there wasn't like an adverse cardiovascular event, but you're in a cast because you didn't have enough body weight to load the bones, you know, Wolf's Law. So um, on Wednesday, we're going to go through just a few case studies, just as an example of, of what you could write up. Uh, these are just things that I or previous um, students have written before, but um, so on Wednesday, we'll talk about CVD cancer and diabetes. We'll try to cram in all three populations. Um, as, as those are three common ones that you'll be working with, that you may encounter, not that you will be working with, but there's a possibility that you'll encounter in your professional lives. And we'll talk about the physiology of what's going on. Why is exercise good? So it's not just, this is really superficial, really topical. Here's risk factors and stuff. We'll start talking about how cells work um, in some of these populations. What, what is going wrong in the physiology and why is exercise helpful uh, in those people? And then on Friday, these are case studies where you have to show up with case studies. So you'll probably write them on Thursday or something. Um, the class is pretty late. You could write them on Friday morning. But if you want a good one, that's going to trick other people. Maybe write them on Thursday. Uh, and so there's no organized lecture by me on Friday. It's just team competition. So we have to have our teams at least picked out by Wednesday night or something like that. So be thinking, and I can help contribute to your thoughts. Uh, but so this is so this is what some students have done uh, before. If you want to do like Michael Scott is a regional manager of a paper distribution company called Dunder Mifflin. In Scranton, he's 42 years old, weighs 183. It didn't mention his BMI, but you could calculate that. To calculate your BMI, just do like, go to Google and type BMI calculator, and then you just plug in the numbers. Um, he spends most of his life in the office, so he participates very little in exercise. You could say something about, you could be a little bit tricky. It has to be, um, you have to be able to translate it somehow into whether the person does exercise. You know, if you come in and you've like you've written it in Amharic or something, and and like <laughs> nobody knows what those letters and stuff mean, and we're like, okay, we have to be able to translate it somehow. But you can be a little bit. You know, he participates very little. You know, exercise. You can be more subtle than that. However, he does play an occasional game of basketball in the basement of his building. Gets his warehouse workers. He will also on occasion do parkour around the office or in the parking lot with Andy and Dwight. Recently, Dwight. Kurt Schrute, assistant to the regional manager, has been boasting about his strength. He's claiming to be bigger, stronger, and more um, virile than, than Michael. This upsets Michael deeply. Michael's heart, soul, and colon are very upset. I remember adding that line. Um, so he decided uh, to start bulking up. He plans to put on 20 pounds of lean mass and be able to lift Dwight's desk and throw it across the room. He'll do anything to accomplish this goal. So something like that, but, but you're going to want to provide a more comprehensive picture of family history, a more comprehensive picture of, of uh, signs and symptoms of disease, stuff like that. But you can get creative in, in how you're doing it. Do you want every characteristic and risk factor covered within it? Yeah, ideally, ideally, if you have every risk factor covered in some way, 
um, where it can be, you know, deduced at least. I don't know if you remember the when you did like Dumbledore versus Gandalf. Do you want like oh, a comparison? Do we do that? You can do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Dumbledore versus Gandalf. Uh, and at the end of Stress Fizz, that was one of the questions that um, that was like super tricky. I just like I just gave it to everybody, but I want to see it. I just want to see people if they can figure it out. Um, <laughs> Um, so you can do something like that, where it's not just a single case study, where it's two case studies and which one dies first. So in this one, it was on the field out here. I think it was Dumbledore and Gandalf are going at it, and they're going to keep going with their wands until someone dies of, uh, you know, sudden cardiac death. And who is it? Who dies of sudden cardiac death? And I think the answer was they die simultaneously. Yeah. It's like when Harry and Voldemort are like locked. Yeah. If they were just both, um, I think that was the answer. You could do something like that, where you say which one dies first or something. But the idea is trying to come up with a scenario that is both answerable and challenging, and hopefully you stump your peers and your peers don't stump you. That's the goal. Are you going to be uh, looking at the CP risk factors or hallucinating the memory? You can have it, yeah. So that thing that I, that PDF that I posted, you can print that out and keep it with you. Um, you can have your computers because you probably need to like look up BMI and stuff. So you can have your computers, uh, and that's it's totally fine to look up that stuff. Just as it's fine if you are a personal trainer, or you're you're in some clinical setting, and you're working with a patient, and they're sitting across the table from you, you can totally just have um, documentation in front of you and ask them much questions and have the questions and the everything in front of you, that's totally fine. And on, on the test, you can do it. You, you can have documentation, whatever, on the test, too. Um, how stressful is it in terms of, like, typing? Is that the first person just shouts and answers? Well, that's funny. It didn't even occur to me that we were... Like, uh, things? That's, that's stressful. I didn't know. That is stressful. Like, like a circle? Like, they pass it? I didn't it, know. It's like, everyone has three minutes, the, and together, you figure out who... I like the idea of time. I wasn't going to time it. I was just saying we have, we have a whole class. But I like the idea of setting a time limit, or at least the first person to get the answer gets like a little bit of extra. Like if they both tied, but this person did it. And yeah, they, both people got the right answer, but this person, this team, whatever got there first. I do, I do like the idea of, um, you know, a finish line. We'll come up with the rules. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do a little canvas post where I have my idea of the rules. Um, and then if you want to come up with some suggestions, we can, we can you know, twist my idea around to be whatever, whatever people. The idea is we learn something in a more practical way um, where you can express, not loathing, but, but um, something less than sportsmanship, right? <laughs> or you can be additionally competitive. Um, and so I think we'll have a good time doing it. We'll have a few of these team days. How many teams are there? How many teams do we want? How many people do we have? We have like... So there's 18 people here. Should we do four teams or should we do three? What do you guys want for teams? How many? The smaller, the better, less. So smaller teams, the better. Okay. Okay. So maybe four uh, total teams. Eight, yeah, eighteen teams. Just <laughs> eighteen <laughs> teams. Uh, let's do let's do four total teams. Uh, and if you have people you want to team up with, let me know. In the past, what I've done is I've come up with a few possibilities for the teams, and then had people vote on them. Um. Maybe we'll do something like that. But if there's people you want to team up with, let me know, and I'll, I'll try to work that in. And then do you want us to send them to you, or just bring printouts? Or... Either way, either way. If you want to send it to me, I can print them um, and bring the printouts. I think we'll have printouts for everybody, so that every single person can be looking at their own. Oh, okay. Actually, yeah, send them to me. Send them to me, and then I can make 20 or whatever total printouts that just by. has each one in them. Send them by. Bye. Thursday night, Friday before I wake up. Okay. I, I wake up early. Um, so, okay, so Thursday night. <laughs> yes, Thursday, Thursday night. <laughs> but before you go to bed <laughs> Thursday, <laughs> before you go to bed on Thursday, um, yeah, have your team send them. And I will, today, I will try to do some 
um, team situated? For the positive risk factor for family history, does the diabetes and family history not count or is it just cardiovascular disease? Um, if there was a, so diabetes, just having diabetes, um, I don't think counts as a family history, okay. but you know, having had a heart attack, having had a stroke, something like this, a, big, a catastrophic event. Okay. Uh, but we can go back to the actual phrasing here. Um, I'm just history. curious, because in the fourth, or in the third case study, there, his dad had family, had family history of diabetes, and I, 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 was, I didn't know if we count that or not. Yeah, so um, myocardial infarction, coronary revascularization, sudden cardiac death, some heart thing. I mean, you list um, cerebrovascular accident, list, you know, other stuff like this, that's, that's, you know, heart attacks and strokes, episodes, kind of big episodes, sudden cardiac death, things like that. Having a diagnosis of something, don't count, but pay attention to it. Because, if, yeah, if somebody has a diagnosis in their family you know, like of diabetes, it's like, okay, let's just make sure. What's your blood sugar? Oh, I don't know what it is. What's a first degree relative? A first degree relative, um, mom, dad, um, I think grandpa, grandma, and a direct sibling. Okay, not cousins or anything? Um, yeah, cousins, I don't think count. So you can get a little bit tricky in your own case size with that one too, and, and first degree relatives. My adopted, whatever, <laughs> my someone in law. Uh, doctor, I have a quick question about the blood pressure risk factor. Okay. Uh, it said you need to take on two occasions or more. Is that a time frame? Is there any sort of time frame for that? Uh, no. I, I, I don't think the time, so if it's like three years apart, uh, then there's something like, okay, why don't we just do this again in a week or something? Um, there may be some studies on how long is too long. I'm unfamiliar with them. Uh, but if it's like more than a few months apart, then I would consider, like if it's like six months or a year apart, I'm like, okay, why don't we just get another one here in a few minutes, in a few days and, and see, see what it looks like. Uh, but blood pressure is something that varies so wildly from minute to minute, from day to day, you know, from month to month, depending on conditions, depending on diet, um, depending on hydration. You know, if you're, if you're really hydrated or dehydrated, you know, if you've eaten a lot of salt uh, for some people, um, if you've just exercised, maybe you're having some post-exercise hypotension, um, you know, so it, it sort of depends on blood pressure, but it's a good question. I don't have a good answer. All right. That's it. For just for the sake of, I don't know, no, you can read it in the video. Um, I mean, there's just a bunch of these things that, you know, if you wanted to like, compare a couple of Lannisters or something, obviously they would have very different risks. Uh, you could get into fiction. I mean, you could do like Job of the Hut or something. That would be fine. Santa Claus. Santa Claus clearly has. I mean, between the age and his tummy, um, he's going to have uh, something. Oh, but it's probably a fair amount of exercise working in the, in the you know, toy shop. Uh, so what you just go through? I don't know. Your your own family, your friends, yourself, uh, pop culture, and come up with some. Difficult to solve, but solvable case study. All right, go do uh, week stuff, whatever happens on Monday. And we'll start talking about CBD and diabetes and cancer on Wednesday. CBD. You did.